everyone's insulin kicked in yet from lunch. Don't really take a nap. <laughs> All right, Dr. Hoenig talked about the what and the why. This is kind of going to be more of a how at the bedside and basing stuff off what he mentioned and we'll dovetail into what Dr. Trump was going to talk about with uh, asynchrony. It's really our objectives. We'll look at uh, discussing catheter characteristics for esophageal pressure monitoring. We'll look at some medications, contra contraindications, talk about placement techniques, and then look at the applications that esophageal pressure monitoring may provide us at the bedside based off of uh, what's been provided with the previous talk. Limitations to monitoring. Obviously, placing a catheter, any contraindication to an NG OG tube is going to be the same thing that applies to this esophageal pressure catheter. So bleeding, trauma, uh, various injuries, surgery, maybe your patient's hypercoagulated with coagulopathy, some ECMO tumors, anything that's going to prevent a catheter going into play is going to apply here. Uh, length and inflation of the balloon, there's several pieces we can look at from uh, Jerry Reed again, which Dr. Pono mentioned. Uh, where the catheter goes, how much air goes into the balloon. Uh, and getting the catheter in the right position in the esophagus is a big thing. That's, this is probably the hardest thing that you'll have to deal with when you're getting, trying to get a measurement to get any catheter in the right place. And it's not difficult, there's just some, some specific times that it may give you some fits. Uh, then the postural effect, uh, the weight of the mediastinum, which he mentioned earlier in his talk, uh, and put the patient uh, is supine, it's applying extra pressure to the esophageal pressure measurement, and then regional pressure variations. Uh, with the patient sitting upright, the catheter is probably going to be in west lung zone two, very much offloaded, but you change that patient position, that lung zone may change, and again, the weight is going to affect uh, how, that, how that's going to apply to the measurement, whether it's supine or prone. So the catheter itself, it's going to be a 5 hertz catheter. Uh, the cost is about 30 bucks, so it's not going to break the bank. Uh, the catheter is closed on the end, so you can't infuse anything through it, put stuff in the wrong place if it gets placed in the wrong area. There is a removable guide wire there. Lots of facilities recommend leaving the guide wire in place in case the catheter has to be repositioned. If you pull that guide wire out, you're not going to get it back in if you pull it out. It comes with extension tubing and a three-way stopcock. So you can see there's already an introduction to place for an error because you've got a stopcock in place. All stopcocks are not created equal. Nurses raise your hands, nod your head. They all work differently in some way or fashion. So you gotta pay attention to what's going on. The way it comes assembled, we recommend moving the stopcock from the pressure line to the catheter itself for operation. We place it. And that's a photo obviously showing putting the stopcock from the pressure line to the catheter to make it better interact with the ventilator. Hooking it to the machine, very simple. Our particular product, I'm sorry I can't talk about this without talking about my product, so I apologize. I wish I could. Uh, it's a very direct connection to the ventilator. Then you're going to access uh, the ventilator to get your pressure measurements, which are going to be integrated and mathematically calculated for you. If the machine happens to be a long way from the patient, you can take art line tubing and get extra length from the catheter to your ventilator to minimize any uh, uh, pressure dampening that you may see. As far as positioning for the catheter, there's a couple of ways to get it in place. Number one, mathematically, you can take the patient's height in centimeters, take that height measurement times 0.288. That'll give you an approximate depth of where you want the catheter to be. Or you can use this, the old nurse's trick, cipher process, ear to nose, estimate the depth that way. And then we'll fine tune it by doing an occlusion test, doing an respiratory hole parameter on the ventilator, doing either an abdominal squeeze and a chest squeeze to verify positioning. And you get examples of uh, in place of the catheter. Most places recommend inserting the catheter all the way to 60 centimeters, knowing that you're likely going to be in the stomach. Once that's occurred, We'll do an expiratory hold on the ventilator, do an abdominal compression, and we should see a rise in esophageal pressure and no rise in your ventilating pressures because we're in different compartments. If you do see a rise in the ventilator side, it should be very minimal compared to what you see in the abdomen. And then we'll start to pull the catheter back. Roughly 40 centimeters or when you start to see cardiac oscillations present on your esophageal pressure waveform, that's kind of going to be where you're going to slow down and start paying attention to uh, where you may stop. That is the second verification. We'll do, the, do another respiratory hold. Now we'll press on the chest. 
and we should see a rise in all pressures because the catheter is going to all be in the thoracic cavity, both your airway catheter and your esophageal uh, pressure catheter. And again, just kind of a visual placement of how it's going to look like behind the heart of the esophagus. And uh, for another visual from a CT scan, you can see the esophagus of the close proximity of the lung pleura to the catheter. But just remember you're measuring in one specific spot, not above, not below. Don't forget what your lung zones play into this. And you can look at this slide at the bottom. Actually, the second waveform up. Let me see. There's no laser pointer on it. Hmm? There's no laser pointer? Okay, so I can try to point then. So if you can see the red arrow, you can look at these bottom two waveforms and you can see rhythmic oscillations. That's going to be your cardiac oscillation superimposing on your waveform. So a good place to verify. Also, on this bottom waveform, you see the arrows, you'll notice that at baseline pressure, this waveform is below zero. And the measurement corresponding is showing a negative number. So in this, this situation, PEEP is set at 12, you've got a negative 4.2 expiratory transpulmonary pressure, which may be reflective of uh, lung pressure being too low, distending pressure. So, first question. We got our errors fixed from the first talk. Your answer didn't appear. <laughs> so, your question is going to be on the previous slide, negative transpulmonary pressure measurement. What do we do to, to fix that number? To make it more closer to zero or slightly positive? Right there. I'm going to see it here. Okay, perfect. So, your answer is going to be B. You're going to elevate your B <laughs> to raise your transpulmonary, your respiratory transpulmonary pressure to a zero or slightly positive number. Now, please note here's the after photo. Note that your change in PEEP related to your change in your transpulmonary pressure is not linear. It is not linear. PEEP was at 12, we had a negative 4.2 number. Now the PEEP is at 20, and our waveform is pretty much at zero. So don't think, oh, my number's negative four, I can raise PEEP by four, it's gonna make things equal out. Nope, you gotta look at your waveform and make everything match up. So looking at applications again, we talked about partitioning of respiratory mechanics as a guide for the maneuver. Uh, to look at recruitment maneuvers potentially, maybe from a driving pressure standpoint. Uh, optimization of vent settings, steady peak, looking at tidal volume as it relates to driving pressure as well. There's going to be passive maneuvers. If you look at active maneuvers, potentially work or breathing. Again, looking at the pressure time product, APRB piece potentially. And then looking at patient ventilator synchrony, having a catheter inside the chest may show asynchrony. And that's going to be where Dr. Trammell kind of highlights his presentation coming up. So two big pressures we look at if you have a balloon in place. Number one, we're looking at the driving pressure, or what's commonly called by Tal Morton's group as the respiratory system pressure. This is what you commonly do at the bedside if you look at this. It's going to be at the very top waveform that you'll see on any ventilator. It's going to be your pressure waveform. So you'll do a plateau pressure measurement minus your PEEP. That's going to be your system driving pressure outside the chest. So chest wall, pleura, all are included in that. If you have a balloon in place, we can now move to our transpulmonary pressure waveform at the bottom. We can do a plateau pressure on the expiratory side, note our pressure, do an expiratory hold, note the end pressure, and then do that math and see this is the same patient. We earlier had a driving pressure of 11.5. The esophageal balloon showed a driving pressure of 8.5. So you essentially remove the chest wall uh, application from kind of from the equation. You're looking for what the lung is actually doing. But again, remember, you're taking that measurement in one spot. The effects of uh, spontaneous breathing on your catheter and your, your waveforms. If your patient's passive, the waveform on your left, you'll notice every time that a breath is delivered, you'll have a rise, a positive spike. 
and your esophageal pressure waveform. If spontaneous breathing is present, it doesn't harm necessarily what's going on, but you'll notice now, every time a breath is given, you'll have a negative deflection every time the patient takes a breath. So some key points to look at. It's easy to look at the waveform and think, oh, a positive is a patient taking a breath in because they're a positive pressure ventilation. But when you compare it to pressure waveform, very different thing you're looking at. So be, be cognizant of that. Right, as far as spontaneous breathing goes, there'll be a different occlusion method that we'll do to verify placement. It's going to change things. Obviously, we talked about the waveform being different. Some things we may show with asynchrony, auto trigger, the machine firing when the patient's not trying to take a breath, or ineffective effort, the patient tries to take a breath, but the machine doesn't communicate with them and give that breath. Uh, cycling, the breath ending, it may end too early, it may end late, could be a delayed trigger, the patient's trying to take a breath and they have to work harder, 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 the machine recognizes the firing. Or double trigger, the patient's taking a breath, the machine thinks it's time to stop, the machine quits, the patient immediately takes another breath in. So with that catheter in the thoracic cavity, you may be able to see some asynchrony going on that may not show up on your specific airway pressure waveform being measured outside your ventilator. All right, so next question. What effect will spontaneous breathing have on your esophageal pressure waveform? Everybody jumped all over that one. Good job. <laughs> C is your answer. It's going to be a negative deflection when the patient gets a breath. Airway pressure will still be positive. Spontaneous breath will drop. All right, so conclusions, again, esophageal pressure monitoring, depending on the patients you're taking care of, the type of lung injury you're dealing with, or the, the uh, disease that's there, may provide you some potentially valuable information. They give the team information about steady P, driving pressure, asynchrony. Uh, you have to worry about technology integration. Currently, there's only two ventilator platforms that integrate esophageal pressure monometry into the machines, uh, and only one of them does the math for you. So the other machine, you have to do math at the bedside. You can do esophageal pressure monitoring away from your ventilator, and it really becomes a little more complex. There's a lot of uh, uh, places for error to develop, because essentially, you'll hook your catheter up, attach it to an arc line set, transduce through your monitor. Then you've got to look at your ventilator and your monitor to get pressure measurements. Then you have to convert your pressure measurement from millimeters of mercury to centimeters of water. So you've got in places that are raw with errors to happen. So technology integration is going to be a big thing. The more simple we can make it, the more globally it's going to be understood. We'll get better results potentially out of it if it's applicable. And obviously that ties into clinical comprehension as well. Once we've got this data, well, what do we do with it? Is it applicable to what we're seeing? Is it useless? And then, as Dr. Honig kind of uh, showed us right now, with esophageal pressure monitoring, there's very limited data. And what's meaningful? A lot more questions than answers again right now. And I think he would probably relate to his medical career in his 30 years or so or more that. Uh, the more we know, the less we really seem to know <laughs> about a lot of things in medicine. I had a physician tell me a long time ago in my practice that half of what I'm telling you now was wrong. I just don't know what that half is yet. But hang around, you'll see what it is. Does anyone have any questions? I know it's not quite as exciting as the how and the what, but. Um, I'm sure you're using this to individualize P on your ventilated patients. Yes. What's the highest P range that you've got to use in this pressure? Uh, with the, with the uh, esophageal balloon, uh, 22 to 28 personal. Some of my colleagues have gone higher with it in trauma or obesity cases. We may have time for one more question. Anyone? next talk is related as well, so we can move on, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. That's good.